And our first speaker is Ben Decry. He is a developer advocate uh, in O of uh, in of zero, sorry. And today he will talk to us about authorized is not a yes no questions. Hi Ben. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, can you share your screen? Sure. I forgot that I didn't happen automatically. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Hi, Jenks. Thanks. Then I leave the stage to you. Thanks, Ben. Lovely. Thanks, Leo. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about this topic, authorization not being a yes, no question. We're all familiar already with clickers not working. There we go. We're all familiar already with um, knowing whether or not somebody's logged in. We've probably played with some code that knows whether or not a user is authenticated. And based on whether or not that flag is true, we allow them to do certain things. Maybe there's functionality they can do. Uh, maybe there's a, an action they take or information they can see. Images not loading are a great thing. <laughs> we'll skip with these. Um, these are basically just screenshots. Actually, what I can do is uh, I can switch to a different version that is working, which is why we have backups. Here we go. Perfect. So you uh, are probably familiar with a number of frameworks that out of the box, you can build your own authorization. You, this is an example of Laravel, for example. You can run a command line operation, which will build the forms, build the database migrations, and get a, an authentication mechanism built in so that um, uh, you, you've got that knowledge of, of who's who's logged in or whether, they're not, whether or not they're logged in at all. Beyond this, or even simpler than this, there are also ways of using social login. You can go to any of the major social login providers and use their login with XYZ capabilities. Again, you're going to get knowledge about who's logged in. Uh, you might even get a bit of extra information depending on the social network that they're logging into. But at the moment, we're looking at just knowing whether or not the person is logged in or not. It's a binary yes, no question. The issue that we want to look at today is what do we do when we want more information than that? What do we do if we want to know whether or not a user has permissions to do a certain action where some users can and some users can't? So as mentioned, my name is Ben Deckroy. I've been a software developer now for 21 years. And that um, old man icon there is how I feel sometimes when I think about how long I've been in the industry, but it's still a really exciting one. Um, I, I love software development because of the endless possibilities and the, the, the fun you can create just by typing with a keyboard. I've been a really big advocate of the developer community, the open source community. Uh, I love anything to do with privacy and security. And these interests have brought me to be the developer advocate today for uh, Auth0 in the APAC region. It used to be slightly further than just that when we were allowed to get on planes. But now, you know, I focus mostly on the APAC region. I've been there for two years now, but I've been using the product itself um, for longer than that. If you want to get in touch with me, um, I'm going to keep an eye on the, the questions as well. Feel free to feel free to put some questions in there while I'm talking if you want. Um, I want to go over a, a, a brief um, an overview of what access control is, and then we'll, we're going to jump straight into a demo so we can see it in action. But if you want to contact me after this, I'm at Ben Decry on most social media um, outlets. I'm not on Facebook, but uh, my DMs on Twitter are open, so feel free to get in touch with me that way. So access control, what do we want to, to look at here? There are two predominant kinds of access control that you might have heard of. The first one is uh, attribute-based access control, and the other one is role-based access control, or ABAC and RBAC, uh, because as, as I often do, as I call it, access-based access control, and we get all sorts of confusion. So we've got ABAC and RBAC, attribute and role. What are the differences between these two? So ABAC is... Um, it's very fine-grained. There are lots of things that we can look at when we're looking at whether or not to grant somebody access to something. You've got the subject. This is the, the person, usually. It could be a machine as well, I guess. But usually, it's a person that's trying to access some kind of resource and do something with that resource. And about a, a person, we might know which department they're in. Are they allowed to access HR records? Uh, what kind of clearance level do they have? This is particularly important in, in government and defense and things like this, where you have uh, secret and top secret and all these various different kind of clearance levels. And a certain person will have access or be granted a certain level of security clearance. 
Um, and then also there are things like age. If you're a social network, then you want to know whether or not they're over the age of 13. That's a, a common age for social networks. So there are all sorts of characteristics or attributes that we can look at about the subject when it, when it comes to deciding whether or not to grant access. Then you've got the action. What is it that the subject wants to do? We're all familiar with things like CRUD, create, read, update, delete. But beyond that, there are also process type actions. Can they generate a report? Or can they approve a request? So depending on the action that wants to be taken, we can also say yes or no, this, this certain action can be taken by this subject. But what is it taking action on? So now we can look at the object. What is it that they actually want access to? Uh, what is the type of that access? Is it a medical record? In which case we want to be quite stringent about who has access to it. Is it a blog post? In which case read access is probably public. Uh, what about the clearance level? We already know that we can define a clearance level against a person, but we also need to apply that to the object so that we've got a point of comparison. There's no point in saying you can only access certain things if you have a certain level when you don't know which objects those are that are restricted to certain levels. And then an interesting one is a geographic location or, or a restriction around where you are. Can you only access things when you're in an office? Can you only access things from certain countries? I won't go into the whole is an IP address a location thing. We know that's a fallacy, but th there's still value in knowing roughly where people are in terms of allowing access to certain things. And then there's contextual. And this is kind of the more abstract. Uh, what time of day is it? Uh, where, where in the world is this person currently located? This would not so much be an attribute of the subject uh, because the subject can move. But contextually, right now, where is the user trying to access information from? And using all of these bits of information, all these attributes piled together, we can build up these complex statements. We can say, is the action approved? Is the clearance level uh, high enough for the object they're trying to access? And are they in a region that we want them to be able to, or that we, we want them to be in in order to access information? Um, an example might be an accountant can only access uh, end of quarter information in the first few weeks of the next quarter um, in order to uh, approve the uh, submission of those records to the government, um, but only uh, if they have a certain clearance level to access that level of sensitivity because it's a government organization and the fine, you know, whatever. So you've got all of these complicated things you can put into attrib attribute based access control. It's really quite powerful, um, but it's also very complicated, which is not a bad thing. I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing. Uh, Jenks, you do like accounting scenarios. I picked this one specifically for you. I didn't actually, um, but I like to think that I did. And I'd like you to think that I did. I'm going to stop going off on a tangent now, get right back on course, and we'll go straight to role-based access control. This is a lot simpler and a lot easier to imagine in your mind. Uh, role-based is essentially roles. Uh, users have roles. Roles can have one or more users, and you assign these permissions to the roles. So you can say things like, um, if you're in the H HR department again, um, then uh, Jenks is testing, his <laughs> testing your listening skills, Jenks. Excellent. That's lovely. Um, so, yeah, you can have a, a role. You're a member of an HR team, and the HR team has access to read information about employees, for example. I've been watching a lot of um, suits recently, and I'm, I think about law a lot in my head, mostly because of suits, not because I'm a lawyer. But uh, another example might be Sarah, who's a senior partner at a law firm. She has the, uh, the permission to terminate or fire an associate. So this permission is assigned to the role. That role is then assigned to the user. And what this allows us to do is if somebody moves company or moves, um, like, like leaves the company or moves internally within the organization, their role can change. And the permissions that are assigned to that role are automatically applied to them. You don't have to manage roles on a per person basis. So having this role as a connector in the middle makes it a lot easier to, um, to understand which permissions are being assigned to whom and for what reason. And if you want a whole group of people to have a new permission, you can just add that permission into the role rather than having to modify every single person. So quick comparison, uh, attribute-based access control, ABEC, is powerful, complex, and fine-grained. It's fantastic if you've got really complicated um, scenarios that you need to account for that don't easily fit into the RBAC model. It is a lot harder to um, conceptualize, though. There's a lot more planning that needs to go into it. And in terms of training of um, like the administrators who are going to look after assigning these attributes to 
the different areas, so the subjects and the the resources, etc. Uh, there's a there's a lot more management and planning, probably documentation, auditing that goes into that. Whereas our back is a lot simpler. It's simpler to conceptualize. It's easy to say, well, I know that this person needs access to the back end of our e-commerce system. Therefore, I need to put them into the e-commerce admin role, and therefore they get all the permissions they need. But of course, there's a lot less fine fine grain control. They they have read write access to everything in there now, rather than just certain. Um, certain elements or certain objects inside this uh, e-commerce system, for example. It is a lot faster, though. I mean, I described before how when you're looking at the attributes, you can create these complex statements of it needs to be in this region and they need to have this security clearance. And you've got this layered approach to calculating whether or not access is granted. And CPUs are fast, and we can't time the difference really with our eyes, so to speak. But imagine the difference in complexity in working out an ABAC rule set against um, a set of scenarios or a set of uh, attributes versus an RBAC rule set. It's going to be much faster to calculate whether or not access is granted in RBAC. So just processing-wise, computers are going to find it easier to calculate uh, the result of an RBAC test. Um, it is coarser grain control, though, uh, as mentioned. So I suppose the ultimate question is, which one should you use? And as with all questions like this, and all great answers to anything as vague as this. The answer is always both or uh, um, uh, either or, you know, it depends. You have to have, you have to look at uh, the situation you're looking at. But what I would recommend is if you're looking at adding access control into the systems you're working on, is start off with RBAC. It is simpler. It's easier to implement. It's easier to manage. It's easier to train your administrators in assigning these roles and permissions to people. Uh, it's easier to define the roles in a system. Uh, there's just a whole lot less going on, but it, it isn't as powerful. So if you get to the point after you've implemented role-based access control that you're finding there's a little bit of extra control you need on top in certain situations, then you can layer that and you can put attribute-based access control on top only where it's required. So you're getting the advantage of the really quick way of it's, it's like a first-pass scan. Are they allowed access to this in general? And then if yes, uh, do we need to do some extra checks based on the attributes of all the the entities in the the not the system, but you know the the calculation that we're making? So that's the quick overview that I wanted to give you of the difference between ABAC and RBAC. Uh, the there's there's a whole lot more information out there if you just search Google for for those. Um, you'll you'll find uh, a plethora of people talking about. Uh, implementing these in different technologies. I want to do a demo today, not in ABAC, because that would probably be, I don't know, a three-hour workshop at the very least. We're going to do an RBAC demo, uh, and we're going to use a, a Gatsby app and an Express API. Now, you don't need to understand JavaScript in order to get through this demo. I've, I want to show you what the, what the steps are that I took to get to the point where the demo is, is ready today. So we're not going to be doing coding from scratch. Uh, mostly because we're a bit time constrained. Um, but I want you to understand how easy it is to use a um, uh, an identity as a service provider. And this doesn't need to be Auth0. This could be uh, there's uh, Keycloak, which is a, um, an open source product that you can run yourself. There are plenty of open source uh, and as a platform type uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0 compatible authentication services out there, whichever one you're choosing to use, uh, many of them will have access control built in as a mechanism. And I just want to go through and help you see uh, what the process would be of adding something like this to your application. So let's say in this hypothetical example, we're going to start off uh, with a new front end. We're going to write this in um, in Gatsby. So I'm creating the, the new front end. And the only bit of code that I need to add in to get Auth0 configured in Auth0, as well as installing the, um, the SDK from, from NPM is this Auth0 provider. And if you're familiar at all with Gatsby or React, you'll understand that what this is doing is basically wrapping the whole application with all the information that's required for, your, for any component in your application to be able to communicate with the Auth0 SDK. Uh, the, the SDK then gives us the ability to do simple things like just wrap the whole uh, component that we want to render with a requirement for there to be authentication. So we, with this one line, we can we can lock down the admin page. So you have to be logged in to access the admin page. And then in the API, we're using Express uh, on, on Node.js. 
where this isn't even using Auth0 SDKs because Auth0 is a uh, standard that uses uh, Auth2.0 and OpenID Connect. So it uses the JSON Web Tokens as a way of communicating um, claims or the things that, we th that we're trying to assert are true. This is Ben, this is his email address, and he has access to these things. So we can use standard JSON Web Token libraries to um, pull them out of the header because they're going to be passed in as a, an authorization header. And the JWK RSA module settings. Now I can start adding permissions in. So the permissions I want to add were these ones over here. So we've got create items, create items, and delete items. So these are the permissions now or the scopes that this API knows how to consume. And then under user management, I'm going to create a couple of roles. So under user management roles, I'm going to create a role called admin. And I'm going to add the permissions to this role for the API that we've just defined. And admin is allowed to do all three. And meanwhile, I'm going to also add a role called editor. And under permissions, we're going to add permissions for this API. And the editor is allowed to create an update, but we're not going to allow the editor to delete. Finally, I need to modify the user. There's only one user in the system. Now, you can assign permissions directly to the user here, but I'm going to assign a role. Um, generally, I would recommend not assigning permissions to a user directly. Uh, use roles for that because it becomes easier to manage. Now, of course, I'm going to need to log out and log back in again because the JSON web token or the access token that we have uh, doesn't have any permission information in it. And if we look over here now, the next time we get a this post request here for the token, let's have a look what's inside this access token. You can now see that the permissions array has been added in. Now, remember in the code, we specified that when we looked at the check permissions, we wanted the custom scope key permissions. So that lines up with this scope key here. So what we're now saying when we do the uh, the authorization check later is does the permissions key contain the, the value create items which will give us access to this one here. So if we go back to the application now, because I'm only an editor, I should be able to come into the admin system and I can add a new item. If I just hit create, that goes in with a default. We can edit the item. That works. But now if I hit delete, and if we jump just over here, we fortify port 7000, which is the API where the API is running. And also that URL there, if you, if you hit that, you should see the new item show up in, in the response. Um, we can see here that the, uh, the gets are all working. The post gave a 201, which is created. Uh, the, the put gave a 200, that's the update. If I hit delete now, we get a 403. Because what's happened is the API has made a check to see whether the um, delete item uh, scope or permission exists, and it doesn't. So with those few lines of code and configuring the, the, the roles in the identity provider that you're using, you can quite easily add auth authorization, a non-binary element to your applications and lock down your applications um, even further and with, without having to do too much in your own, in your own um, project in terms of your own uh, coding. One thing I would... That's gone to that's the wrong tab. That's the one that wasn't working. One thing I would say though um, is there's going to come a point at which even the role-based access control, uh, even if all you need is role-based access control within the identity provider, is not going to work. It's great for starting off with an MVP. Even some more um, mature, long-running applications will will get away with running um, role-based access control out of the identity provider in this way. But remember that the more uh, roles or permissions rather that you have, the bigger that access token is going to get. So you're going to get to a point where the access token gets uh, to a size that, and, and this access token is getting passed in the header every time you, you talk to an API. So if you start noticing that the, the access token is getting so large that either it's too large to fit in the API header, which could happen, uh, or it's just slowing down the requests, which can happen as well with the, the size of the the overall request now, that you might want to start moving things into um, a more standard access control management system within your API. But it's a great way of getting started and locking down your application, securing your API 
without having to put a huge amount of investment into a, a larger solution that you might need down the track, but you probably don't need uh, at the moment for, for some of your applications. I'd like to thank you for your time. I hope that's made sense. Like I've said, Authero is sponsoring, so head over to the booth. I'll be there after this talk, um, and we can go into more depth about any of this if you're interested. I can talk to you about how JSON Web Tokens work or uh, more in-depth stuff about the, um, the, the role-based access control. But again, thank you for your time. I don't know, Leo, if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, I think we could have one question. Um, I think there is a question from Phil. He asked, uh, he said, I think that we need to keep permission information updated and check permission with every request. He said. So the, the permission is baked into the JSON Web Token and that gets sent into the, the API. So the API, generally APIs aren't stateful. So you're not gonna have uh, the same kind of cookie or session relationship as you would have with a, a traditional web application. So generally, you, you don't want to remember those things in a session anyway. And it's a great way of storing that. And the, the, the header, the authorization information being in the header payload means that the API can verify that without having to make third party calls. Um, one of the things that JSON Web Tokens does over something like an opaque token, which is the 64-ish character random looking strings that don't actually contain any information, is the API will consume those and then have to check with the issuer to see if it's still valid, and then maybe do a lookup to see what it means. Whereas having it all in the JSON Web Token means that the API doesn't have to do that. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I think it got you. Thank you, Ben. And That's thanks right. for yeah, and thanks for giving us a great presentation. And <clears throat> you're very welcome. It's been great to be.